So welcome to Guitars, Gear, and Geeks. Uh, here to talk about anything and everything and with music, uh, guitars, uh, life, anything there is. Uh, our guest today is Dave Anderson. Uh, you might know him from Brother Kane. And uh, what is it? Uh, Black Jacket Symphony and also Dave Anderson Project. Yep. So, and also um, play in the rhythm section. Oh, the Atlantic, Atlantic Rhythm Section. That's right. So, um, anyway, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I yeah, appreciate you coming on. Um, I don't know where to start. I was noticing, uh, kind of caught me off guard. You did some stuff for some movies and TV shows, mm -hmm. which is really cool. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I had a few placements with, uh, we had some dragmatic songs on some uh, original MTV shows. This, this is, 20 years ago um had a had a disney movie um uh another dragmatic song was in dawson's creek it was a recurring um when pacey and joey were together whenever they got together they played our song and we made it to the series finale so that's pretty cool yeah nice yeah i, I that's one thing i didn't know because it, it showed uh you know some of the stuff i was looking up and I mentioned MTV's Toughen Up and America's Top Model and mm -hmm. a variety of different things. And, you know, I know you've dabbled in a little bit of this and that, but it kind of caught me off guard, which I thought was awesome because a lot of a lot of artists do that. A lot of people don't realize uh, how involved they are in different areas. Right. Yeah. And it, it's a lot it's a lot bigger now. Lic uh, licensing is a big part of what fans and musicians try to do now. I'm about to try to get back into it. Oh yeah, that's good. Nice. So, what's your current status uh, as far as playing goes for the li like live shows and stuff? Um, I my main gig is Atlanta Rhythm Section, um, and um, I'm obviously not an original member. They had a lot of hits in the '70s when I was a fan, and I've been playing guitar for them for about 15 years. And uh, um, I'm working on some some original recordings and uh, trying to do my solo project that i've never done so it's kind of the bucket list that, yeah. that i better do it or i'm not going to do it yeah that's awesome so are, are you do all the producing are you mixing mastering the whole yes and no. I, uh, i've got some tracks i have a drummer friend um james urban and he's uh he's actually a singer songwriter and and does records recording all the instruments himself but um I've got a band that we play with once in a while, but um, so far what I've recorded, I just I do most of the recording and he lays dr drum tracks down. And, and I've had a couple different producers I've worked with and produced myself. So it's just kind of, it's kind of been at least five years in the making and I've got a bunch of stuff, 80% done. And I'm trying to get it all wrapped up and ready to get out there. And I've also done another project um, recently with um, uh, Charlie Cav, um, I hope I'm pr pronouncing it right. He's he's a keyboard player for Angel. I don't know if you remember Angel. Yeah. But um, we uh, ran into each other on a, a rock cruise that Atlanta Rhythm Section and Angel were both on. And, and we hit it off. And and uh, he had some tracks that he recorded. This was during COVID. So he had some musicians remotely doing doing some instrumental tracks. And he sent one to me because I sent him a, a version of my solo release, Welcome. It's a, it's a song that I released. And it's kind of Beatles-y. And um, and he said he wanted something kind of prog or and also kind of tears for fears, so I um, I wrote lyrics for it, kind of a sci-fi kind of kind of. Um, Is that the welcome to the first day of your life? No, that's my solo song that he listened to that got him into got me into this project. So oh, okay, okay. I wrote lyrics for. It. I'll send it to you. I, I wrote lyrics for it, and um, and then it's uh, Deco Entertainment is the is the label that he's that he runs and he and his partner who's also kind of a playwright not kind of he is a playwright as well as running the the, the label but they wanted to make a concept out of it so it, it became we did three songs we're about to release it and it's i think it's going to be there's, there's a comic book along with it and it's going to be released uh, in in uh like a a promotional partnership with um oh what's what's the the big comic book store on the east coast newberry thank you newberry comics is gonna is gonna do a 
do a promo with it. And so we're, we're we did three songs and we're about to record three more. And uh, that just kind of that's just kind of happened. And recently, um, mutual friend Pete Clett, I did a did a collaboration with him. Yeah. And, um, and that's kind of a cool thing. He it's the same thing. It's weird because it's the, both projects I didn't play the guitar on. I just sang. And Pete had a track, and um, uh, I had had him mix one of my songs, and then he sent me this track. He said, "I've got a, a project. I'm trying to have different vocalists put write the lyrics and melody and sing on this track." And he he had a working title, "Pain into Ashes." He said, "You don't have to use it, but that's kind of the prompt." So I did I did the first one, um, and there's another guy. Um, I should have taken notes before I got in here. Um, that just did the second version. His is his is really good. So um, those are getting released. That's uh, it's, uh, two side things that just kind of fell in my lap. And yeah. of course, playing with the Atlanta, Atlanta rhythm section, um, and we're fairly busy. So how does it uh, with you jumping in and playing with Damon or Brother Kane, I should say? How how does that happen? Just spontaneously when they're when the timing aligns yeah it's uh when they started this tour um damon has a drummer that he's played with with a solo project for for years and um there's a, a guitar player also um that he's played with in his solo projects they both play for, for tom keeper um oh, and okay. uh so when he's said on on this tour he's it's basically a version of his solo band and uh we we talked and he reached, reached out to all of us that he was about to do it and he knew i was busy with ars and he said whenever we can fit the schedules together so i did i did one show with them um at the the monsters on the mountain in gatlinburg and when they came to my hometown i got up and played a few songs so um that's you know it's 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 an open door whenever it will work but um the and also buck johnson is playing with for him he's another um birmingham buddy that's uh He's Aerosmith's yeah. keyboard player and does the harmony vocals. And he he's was in Whiskey he, Falls. Hmm? He was in Whiskey Falls, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Hell okay. of a say. So yeah, they've got it. Not an individual. Mm -hmm. He's yeah. I, I didn't know he's playing for Aerosmith. Wow. Yeah, he's been doing that. I think for about five years. Oh geez. Yeah. That's cool. Wow. Pretty cool. <laughs> Small world though. Everything comes together because. It really is. It really like He's talking to you. Talking. Yeah. You know, it's it's the music world is is small and it just gets smaller. It, and you're right. It does. Huh? You can start connecting once I, I started playing more live and got involved with people. Um, you know, we start opening for more national acts and people are coming through town, then it's before you know it, they know someone you know, and it's the small circle. And then it kind of goes up the chain, if you will. You know, you got your Eddie Van Halen or somebody up that's way up there but there's a connection just it right. just goes it, it's cool six degrees mm -hmm. of bacon separation or whatever that is yeah it's it's yeah. True. no for sure i mean yeah it's it's crazy but um yeah pete and had just i think you had just finished that recording when uh pete borrowed my gear for the show we did up here with lotus crush right and so we were talking about it and actually that was the week after you did the first show with brother Kane, right because pete was going to tell me he's like, well, yeah, dave went up there and played and i was like no i already know i already I was, i'm on it because you know, <laughs> i'm already just off brother Kane like mad but <laughs> oh i didn't mention the, uh, the very important part of it glenn maxey the original bass player for brother Kane, is on this <laughs> tour and he left the band in 93. So I was thrilled to see that he's back with the band. I I grew up with Glenn. We we knew each other way before. Um, so to, to back up a little bit, how did Brother Kane come come together to get the lineup that was on Seeds and Wishpool? I mean, I kind of, or I mean, you can back up all the way to the first CD if you want. I can. It's 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 a kind of a strange journey because they had a band called Child with a Y, not an I. Yeah. And, and it was it was uh glenn maxi it was damon and um then they ended up getting roman glick to play rhythm guitar which he didn't want to play rhythm guitar damon just said you're a rock star pick up a rhythm guitar and he <laughs> did um scott collier um and once yeah. they got line up they they did some showcases they had a had a guy at virgin records that was really 
really into them, even though they didn't have, have quite the direction yet. He just knew there was something there. So um, he kind of did a development thing and um, they auditioned a bunch of singers. And um, at, when they were first together, they were still still kind of 80s rock. They weren't like, you know, uh, full on hair band, but it was it was it was more that kind of hard rock. But but then the Black Crows came out and Damon was always a little bit more uh, rootsy rock to begin with anyway. So yeah. so kind of went towards the, that sound a bit. And um, after they went through a bunch of auditions for singers, um, the A&R guy just said, why don't you sing? So he just kind of fell into that. And then they did the first record and it did really well. Yeah, Damon had mentioned he was singing a, a few covers or singing three songs or something on some of their sets. Yeah. Just to kind of give the singer a break or whatever. Right. And that they, yeah, someone captured that, obviously. Yeah. So then um, moving forward, so you got uh, Roman that goes to base, mm -hmm. and then and then you come into the picture, right? I got together with him, and played. I'd known Damon probably for ten years up till then, from uh, just from Alabama music yeah. scene. That's kind of the way it is here too in Seattle. It's regardless of what genre you play, it could, it could be death metal all the way down to to country, and it's like everyone knows each other and is friends, right? It's it's cool, yeah. Especially after the whole grunge wave is gone and done, now you have people that are going every direction. So when you go to one venue, you don't know what to expect, which is good. You know, everyone's yeah. actually doing their own thing. Now that's just all following a trend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very cool. So yeah, it sounds like it's kind of the same. I mean, like the whole music industry seems to be that way. Yeah, yeah. It's good to see people that 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 are still doing it now from from when we were doing it years ago and and um whether it be different things just it's good to see people still standing yeah no it's i i'm happy to to see that dame resurrected brother kane just because the catalog alone you know so, so many good songs yeah just, just to have the, the fans want to hear that live and then plus if, if he does end up doing something new that you know that's just a bonus on top of it yeah but, yeah um yeah i mean it's it's been cool i, I wanted you now back in 98 when you guys played here you and i were talking about this on the phone but um you guys went went out on tour uh with van halen on on the seeds tour yeah the seed album sorry on the balance tour and there's a couple of comments and right on both counts yeah <laughs> but someone made a comment about uh i don't know if it was you or damon about um people had to be michael anthony had to be careful about breathing on eddie yeah yeah there was a thing called matt anthony's cafe and uh it was basically behind all of his bass stacks his bass tech kevin dugan had it set up with like a bunch of chili pepper Christmas lights. Um, and, you know, it had the big road cases and had all yeah. the different stuff for bass strings and, and tools. And then there was a drawer full of Jack Daniels <laughs> and had a cooler full of Budweiser. And basically whoever was opening up or any of his friends, or sometimes we could bring our friends would hang out during the show. And um, there was long segments because Sammy would do his solo acoustic song and, you know, he talked to the audience he drew it out so that was that was a long segment of course alex and eddie's different solos those took a while so there he had a lot of time to socialize so he he'd come in there and and you know he'd pass the bottle, the bottle of jack daniels around hand everybody a budweiser and whenever he went back out you know there's a little curtain right to the right of the back of his bass amps and and kevin would pull the curtain and he had banaca and he would just like put it <laughs> hold it above mike and drop it into his throat and um it's because ed said man mike when you come share the mic with me it's like uh i can smell the jack daniels because he was on the wagon for the bounce yeah. tour yeah so so that's why he did that before before he would go out there <laughs> it's just crazy yeah. it just cracked me up because yeah just just ed just the way he is you know yeah <laughs> he, he he uh 
he's he's he, he's always on it, but he's got that sarcastic side to him too. Oh, definitely. You know, he's so easy going and all that stuff that I, I can only imagine what you guys uh, experienced touring with them. You know? Oh, it couldn't have been nicer. Ed, Ed was so nice. And, uh, yeah, of course, okay. I'm with Mike. So, Mike, it's, uh, every, every time I met Mike, he most kind, kindest guy in the world. Yeah, definitely. And, and Kevin Dugan as well. I ran into him after a show at a casino and him and his brother were having lunch in a booth behind my wife and I. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh, Kevin's right there. That's cool. Yeah. And I wanted to approach him and just say, Hey, thanks for coming up and playing, you know, and just get, you know, give him a thank you. And, and, uh, we both happened to be finished dinner and, and check their bill out. And we were both stood up and spent the same time. And, and we were both walking out the same direction. It actually turned out that Kevin's brother lives up here. He doesn't see his brother. So they were having lunch or late dinner together. And, uh, and his brother gave me a handful of guitar picks. <laughs> and then Kevin gave me a whole bunch of them. And he was kind as can be. It was cool. Kevin, Doogie's always been a good guy. But, uh, are you frozen? Uh oh. Did you freeze up on me, Dave? Yeah, it's possible. Oh man, well, let's see what happens here. Let's see if we can get Dave back. Might have to reconnect. Yeah. Oh, there you go. He froze up on us for a second. Okay. Sorry about That's that. Okay. Some of the yeah, the internet's not spot on, I swear. These things go nuts. Right. <laughs> so uh, sorry. Go ahead. Did you have sorry on my end? Oh, okay. Um as for gear, you and I were kind of chit-chatting about some of the stuff you were using back in the day. Uh, what was it, PV Ultra? Yeah, yeah. That was a uh, pretty badass amp for the time. I mean, I loved it. I thought it was great. I had a 5150 that um, that Eddie gave everybody that that opened up for every guitar player that opened up for him on the balance store got a 5150 half stack. Um, and I, um. I'm not really sure why I didn't why I didn't use that on the on the seeds, I mean on the on the wishful. But we were friends with uh, with Lad and and I think Johnny from PV, and um, they came over to our rehearsal place because Meridian's not that far from Birmingham, and brought brought some amps and I liked the Ultra amp, but uh, it, it had a when you there was three channels and when you flip the the foot switch it would yeah. change the PV logo. Yeah, and light up. Rehearsal, I put some some gaff tape over it, and they came back over, and Lad said, "What the hell?" And I said, "Man, it's that I can't deal with the light." And he's he just I think Johnny might might have gone and unplugged it, and uh, so it's good now. They just unplugged the wire, but it was a great sounding amp. Yeah, you no, know, it was. I was blown away. I actually uh, never heard one live, and I was a, a local band was playing them, and the guy he took the PV logo off and he put an alien face on there. So the alien face changed from purple to green. <laughs> it cool. was perfect. That's great. <laughs> but no, the tone sounded good. Yeah. I was impressed. Yeah. I don't know whether there were 606s or EL34s, but regardless. A, sure. Yeah. I don't have that amp anymore. So I, I, yeah. I can't. But, what are you using nowadays? Uh, what, when I tour with the Atlanta rhythm section, I usually have a, a JCM 800. Um, a 50 watt and but i uh, but i had an amp oh i still have it swamp works a local guy scott johnson builds them and um and it's 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 an american you know 6l6 and i you know i i just started getting into the into the british sound more and um he's actually gonna gonna redo that amp to british style and i also have a uh uh friedman runt 50 Those which made cool like a like a quieter 800 with a fender clean channel so i haven't since we backline all of our tour stuff i haven't really had many chances to play it live but when i get my solo stuff together um that'll be most of my rig nice the freedom the freedom stuff's great oh man it's really nice yeah you, you can what whatever tone you want you can go get it yeah yeah you know? I, I will say uh, the recordings I sent you of my band, 
I was playing a Hughes and Kettner switchblade which had a uh, PL thirty fours in it. And that right. Thing, that thing was ballsy as hell, but uh, Michael Wilton from Queensrÿche turned me on to it. Right. And uh, hooked me up, got me a discount on one, so I, I, that's the one I used. That thing, man. Great tones on the recording. Thanks. It. Uh, I expected it to have more of the Marshall bite, that British crispy, mm -hmm. you know, that higher end. That glassy. Um, yeah, there you go. And it uh, it just had a nice, smooth overall sound. And it didn't matter. One song I used a Paul Reed Smith, and I used a Coil Tap. And then one song I used a Charvel. I'm using all different types of things. And that, that amp just delivered. It was, yeah. But, but getting back is the, the Friedman stuff's the same. You can grab a P90 and then go grab like, uh, you know, an EMG or something. Right. And you can still capture that clarity and articulation that those yeah. amps produce. Yeah, they're 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 great. I, I play Strats through it, play Les Paul through it, and Telly through it, and and they all they all sound like they're supposed to. Yeah. That's one thing I was going to ask you too is about your guitars. You've always seemed to be a Telly fan or play Telecaster yeah. quite a bit. Play Telly guy with uh, with with brother Kane, and um, and I had two uh, two Tellys that uh, I had a Fernandez endorsement, and um, and one of them, you know, I, I my my son rest in peace. He he's a, he was a musician, and he would see pictures of my old gear and say, "Oh shit, Dad, when did you sell that?" And I said, "Well, <laughs> you're." You know, remember that electric uh, Hummer you used to ride around in? Your mom said, "Sell that and buy that." But uh, I said, "You know, when we when we get to heaven, we get all our gear back." So I'll I'll find out about that. Maybe he knows. But um, but I had I had a couple tellies, and I sold one of them. Like I said, that's where I got on that tangent. And um, another one I was I got stolen out of a studio I was working out of a lot. So I didn't have a telly for a lot of years. And I, uh, when I started doing black jacket um i i got back into strats because we were doing the, the the dark side of the moon yeah show. just like the one right behind you uh yeah there's uh this gold one um and look, shepherd builds a lot of my electrics and um he had built that one for himself years ago and i said i need a strat and um and he said well i've fallen out of love with goldie and i'm gonna let her go so he, he let me buy that for a for a really good price and um Okay. Then I need fair and um and I said I'd need another strap, but I really wanted to have the Gilmore um look, you know, the the black pickguard uh black body with the Yeah. The simplicity the of the class. And uh he called me and um about two hours later and, and um he said come down to the shop and he had had all these parts. One of them was a twenty two fret neck, which is helpful if you're playing money, but um and it was a neck from one of his guitars he built for uh, uh, Mike Fontenot, a local guitar hero of mine. So it had that mojo on it. He had it ready in two hours. So, uh, oh, geez. And he yeah. built me a Les Paul that I love. I used that with the Atlanta Rhythm Section because that's uh, um, it's more of a Les Paul gig. Even though um, Steve Stone and I, we, we fill the shoes of, of J.R. Cobb and Barry Bailey, the originals, but we kind of sometimes he's doing Barry and and I'm doing Jr. and and back and forth. But um, so I I'd like to start taking the telly and the strat out too because we fly a lot and I just take if if we're if we're if it's regional and and we're on the ground I'll bring those spares. Um, but yeah, it's I'm happy with those Tommy Shepard guitars are just great. Sweet. Um. This is speaking of tour, what's your guys' I mean, coverage? Because I've seen there was um, not too far from here in Seattle, probably 40, 30, 40 minutes south of us, there was a show booked. Is there one yeah. on the book now? Well, no, this is about last year, I think. Yeah. And they had you in the commercial I saw on TV. Oh, gotcha. I, go, I go, no fucking way. That's not Dave. And then yeah. I go look up the videos. I go, "What's he up to?" And then that's how I I triggered on to what you. Okay. Kind of <laughs> wow. Well, yeah, I I had to stop doing black jacket in 
2016 because I had I had a full commitment with ARS and Black Jacket wanted the same thing and and I'd actually do some booking and just crossing my fingers that a date didn't come in with the other band and and ARS was really good about it. They had a buddy of mine um, let me ha have a buddy fill in for a show um, that I had a conflict with with black jacket but that was it and understandably so and it got rained out so my buddy didn't get to play the gig i felt terrible sorry robin um but you know, I, it was it was too much i couldn't book both and and it was it was an easy choice to stick with ars but i do miss the black jacket because i did some beatles shows with them like abbey road and sergeant pepper with an orchestra which was fun and my baby was the was the pink floyd thing so that's funny because I, I've got friends that'll that will that will message me on Facebook and say I bought my tickets. You know they'll be wherever I'm coming to see yeah. if I saw you on the commercial. It's like sorry, I just, I'm not it's doing funny. it. It's but, funny because uh, the first time I saw the commercial, I caught just part of it and I looked and I go, ah, it looks like a lot, Dave. And I, and I I just went and sat down, did whatever, and then it came on again. I'm like, no way. I'm like. <laughs> That's got, that's his twin. That's, I mean, so, you know, I, so I get on and look it up. Sure enough. I'm like, yeah. no shit. I'm like, and then um, it showed the lineup of artists who were playing and your name wasn't on the roster. Right. So I didn't buy a ticket, obviously. <laughs> but, well, I'm, it would have been good that I, I helped pick out the guy that, that took my place and he's really great um but yeah there was there's friends of mine that i said well go anyway it's gonna be great and then some that said well i'm not going if it's not you so it's it's uh um it's great either way i mean they, the cool thing about black jacket is is i've, I've played with a lot of bands and i played with a lot of great musicians but but as far as how pro the players were i mean we would do uh dark side of the moon and um and then do the second set of, of assorted pink floyd songs and we do one or two rehearsals and everybody had a there was a wow. you know a thread online that we divvy out parts so you sing the high part on on time you know and and we'd have all our parts figured out the guitar players would would divvy up parts and uh we'd show up and and just basically run the show and it's like man i've never i've never been in a situation that's that just ready to go and not that all the other bands I've been in haven't haven't been great, but we've all had more time to do it. We've had time, like you know, we've we've got so many weeks to get ready for this tour, so many weeks to get ready for this record or whatever, um, and and take our time with it. But but you know, when you're when you're doing something that you're covering something, the parts are all there. There's nothing to figure out. You just as far as what to play or not to play, it's just you learn it. It's it's right yeah. there. So it was that was a cool experience. And, some great great players i got to play with with that that some of them are still doing it i was gonna say that the, the uh the players that are in that band are phenomenal i mean yeah every detail you know keyboard player drummer i mean everybody else watching they're on their game i mean they're delivering yeah yeah that's that it's pretty impressive man well, I certainly made the right choice, but I definitely miss doing those shows. Do you see yourself going back and doing that at some point? You think? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 uh, um, anything could happen. Um, like if if I know that there's a uh, a, a a long period that that ARS isn't playing and they have um, a show, but because they book tours of albums, they do they go. We're doing Full Moon Fever, which like right now they're doing rumors that and and they've got a ton of dates they're really busy and then when they're done with that they're going to go out and do full moon fever so so it's not the same lineup every record they they pick and choose who's the best players for that record so yeah especially if you, yeah going through all these different you know fleetwood mac to pink pink floyd to beatles or that, that totally different animals they did led zeppelin the guy they have doing it is really good now he's really great but when they first did zeppelin shows buck johnson who we were just talking to would yeah. do the right plant and um at that point i think damon was still because damon started that the black jacket um with another friend mm -hmm. 
Willoughby from Birmingham. And um, and then he was on to Alice Cooper and he just couldn't really he couldn't really commit. Yeah, but um but they but Buck said I want to do Robert Plant and and I I think I have this right. Apologies to Damon and Buck if I get it get it wrong, but I think <laughs> they still made him try out, you know, and uh I don't know if there was a doubt that he could do it or whatever, but but he came in there and sang and, and they were like, <laughs> All right. But then when <laughs> When my wife and I went to see it, um, Mark Lanner, who was the drummer that 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 I did all the show, most of the shows with that I do with Black Jacket, Buck went off stage and from behind the kit, he sang "Days and Confused" and um, and I think uh, might be "Ramble On." I'm not sure if I have the songs right, and the the plantness didn't didn't diminish at all. He was just killing that, which I didn't. I knew he was an incredible harmony singer. I didn't know he could do that. So yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Sure. That's impressive. Yeah. You, you don't see anybody doing that. Well, except for them. <laughs> right. After trying that. No way in hell. Yeah. So uh, you and I were kind of talking about uh, uh, Second Coming and those guys and Kelly Gray and all the. We, yeah. The uh, Wish Pull Tour. Should have called it the Kelly Gray Tour. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> all the bands in that, in that thing, I just. You know, Candlebox, uh, Second Coming, you guys. And there's another band. And when you were saying Hughes and Kettner made me think of it, that recorded at London Bridge. They were an Atlanta band, but they recorded at London Bridge. And they were, we they did a bunch of dates with us. Uh, Rusty Cobb, he worked with, um, uh, oh, who's the Atlanta? Marvelous Three, um, the singer-songwriter for, for them. He had a studio and Rusty became their main engineer, but he was, a guitar player and they recorded at, at, at London Bridge. They played he was getting Rams and I can't remember the name of the, the band. But yeah, it was it was all Kelly Gray, John Plum, um yeah. lineups. Yeah, that was a uh, that that out that outdoor show. Yeah. I mean the, the sound usually they what they would do is they would have the local radio station would throw on what they called Pain in the Grass. Right. Every Friday, uh, you know, they'd have random artists comes up, you know, come up and play their set. And then have, you know, four bands or whatever it was, and then have a headliner, obviously. And uh so it it varied from week to week. You could have rap artists, you could have rock. I mean, most of it was rock and stuff like that, you know, right. Alternative, whatever you want to call it. Um, but your guys' uh announcement was only like days before hmm. it was bizarre and so i called the radio station and i asked him i said, I said brother can you play anywhere else he's like nope this is it wow i was like you got to be kidding me he goes what that ain't good enough for you asshole i'm like well <laughs> i'll take a free show but i want to go see him again if they're gonna be playing you know you guys are gonna be around but uh yeah yeah it was a, a last kind of a last minute announcement but i was gonna say getting back to that was the who uh, props to whoever did the mixing and the whole sound because you guys is everything was balanced everything everything cut to the mix it's that was mike, great. mike vega our front of house guy was the shit yeah that show i mean it, who else it, was on that i don't remember i don't i used to remember that stuff really well but that show i remember the show really clearly i remember where they out Door stage was the space needle was right there, yeah. Uh, and it was all behind you. The museum for the space needle, right? It was just right outside yeah. there. Yeah. Grass. And I know Rick and Raj from London Bridge were there. Yeah. Remember what other bands were on the show? I yeah, I, I don't recall because uh, at the time we were living across the way on the peninsula, so we had to take a ferry to get to Seattle to get to the show. Uh -huh. the so we were barely we barely made it on time. Wow. And then. Yeah, and then we cut cut off of you guys after the show, but that's funny you, you remember that because I remember there was a whole bunch of us and we we're just trying to chit chat with you guys and kind of say hi and thanks and stuff like that. And you know, I mentioned before we got a couple of guitar picks from you guys and uh and then we started talking about Van Halen somehow and then there was you were telling a story and Damon would say something and you know all Van Halen heads and 
all these different stories and stuff nothing negative by any means but it was just cool to hear all these different perspectives and stories and just yeah. inside stuff you know you don't get to hear it was like holy shit that's badass that's so cool it was yeah i definitely didn't didn't forget that because <laughs> i totally remember that. yeah i remember roman he was just kind of chilling he, yeah. he wasn't he was he wasn't doing much he was just kicking back yeah that's roman depending yeah. on yeah we were kind of the wild, the wild team, so it's just he was, he was chill, but he, but he was also not. <laughs> I know, yeah. You get him wound up, and he's gone. Yeah. Um, the crow flies. Who can you elaborate on that song? Who wrote? That's I mean, that, obviously all of you can see all you guys were all involved in it, but how did that's Kelly that Gray all over it. He and Damon co-wrote that, and, oh. and Kelly plays the guitar solo on it. Right. The yeah, you hear the wall on there. Yeah, so that that song and um, "I Surrender" I think were the Kelly co-writes on that album, which okay. I I surrender. I think it's a crime that wasn't a single. I thought that was to me almost more obvious in line the bet I make to be a single. Yeah, would have been a great single. That was good. that was a killer tune. What, what about Machete? Machete was Machete was a good tune. It was fun to play live. Yeah, that was uh that was a uh um one of the songs Damon wrote with Marty Fredrickson, who was a uh, he produced C's and he was uh assist uh, associate producer. I'm not sure what his role was on on the the first album, but uh, uh he and he and Damon have worked together forever. And he's he that uh that connection with with uh Marty is how Buck got the Aerosmith gig because Buck went on to do a lot of records producing with and co-writing with aerosmith oh wow look at that that's funny how that works yeah um, and then you got mirrorball which was an amazing song don't get me wrong but it kind of caught me off guard it was kind of out of left field just the intro of it and then the yeah. way it evolves yeah and then it just grabs you it was that that whole thing i mean yeah that's that was <laughs> Yeah, that was one of those songs that you know it's uh we kind of on that album on on Wishpool branched out because like you know you always even if you're not trying to copy a song or copy an artist there's references always like yeah uh, like for the guitar parts i can't re it seems like i did some of the signature parts on winter ball or maybe i just did live i can't remember but uh my camel from 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 Petty was a name that we would throw. Let's it needs more Mike Campbell. It needs more. So we would we would on that song we were the usual kind of th things that we drew from weren't as constant. There was there was a lot more different kind of things. So did when you guys were in the process of doing the production and stuff of of Wishpool was Kelly putting his two cents in on stuff like that and help, help oh, sure. shape things. Since he was a, since he was a rock musician that played in bands, you know, he he uh, um, he was in the trenches. I mean, he 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 was even he was a real detail guy too. He was he he was good to know. He could be very specific on what he would suggest, which which um, which I think is great. I mean, I, I you know, because some producers are let's make this sound like footprints on the beach, you know, but he'd be like let's. <laughs> You know, and and um, I like right down to he. I, I learned a lot from him because um, he even would would um, would fine tune it to say, uh, let's make sure that the symbols aren't happening at a certain uh, um, uh, consonant sound on the lyrics. But I don't think that was ever implemented. I don't think he ever said to Scott and Damon, you know, let's let's line these up. But just the th the the fact that that thought he presented kind of said a lot about how he does. ahead of time and also the, the 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 remarkable thing about that record to me is that um i think it's the best sounding brother kane record and kelly produced it and he mixed it and that yeah. you know that every day and um like you know seeds as great as seeds is we had marty was our producer um jeff tomei was our engineer and, and he did some huge record siamese dream and tim palmer mixed it he was uh 
he mixed tan he mixed uh uh tears for fears and all those great people that that album don't i don't think it sounds as good as as, as wishful wishful but kelly was you know john plum was was the engineer so he's there's a lot of props there but but he and kelly worked so tightly they were almost the same guy so it was still all in-house i mean it was just all in-house and that record came without going through different expert cogs in the wheel not that he wasn't an expert but you know not let's get this engineer this producer this guy mixing you know it's funny how that works it's all alchemy and and, and i don't think there's any set way to figure it out it just worked yeah it's it's interesting how uh producers they can you know have that forward hearing because mm -hmm. you've already gone through the songs 20 30 times or whatever you've done your scratch track you've done enough the producer knows what you're after right so they can hear miles ahead you know what what the parts and pieces what they picture you know what the canvas what kind of paint's going to be on there right um, and kelly he uh especially working with queens right and stuff like that i mean he he can kind of back things up to you talking about him being in the trenches he started out with jeff tate and myth before jeff joined queens so it was kelly gray and jeff tate <laughs> right and it was kind of kind of interesting how that started but uh and then you know kelly obviously is still involved with jeff and, and all that stuff but uh he uh another another cool part and i don't want Cool. wish pull documentary but another remarkable thing that i learned a lot from that record is um and this was pro tools was around but it wasn't um it wasn't on every record then and i don't think there was any pro tools used because it was it was that nave board and and that is it a, i don't remember what the what the tape machine was but um was it one was uh it was it was it was a maybe otari but it was you know a 24 track two inch um but what we would do um we would do three takes or four takes but the last take was um scott you do every fill that you can think of you know go nuts think about precision and um john plum would go upstairs had a little editing suite i don't even know what it was the digital editor which is probably ancient now but he would spend a couple hours and edit it i'm not sure they he must have done a an, an example edit and then they went and spliced the tape fitting with that edit i can't imagine what kind of note taking that had to take but um but it was a really great way whenever i'm recording with a live band i still to this day it's like you know when we know we have two or three takes that we that we can get what we need out of well let's do an abandon let's do a reckless take because who knows what kind of magic we might grab from it so right. that's something doing that record it's, it almost seems like some of the spontaneous stuff or when you're not giving a fuck you just, I'm just exactly gonna, uh, no, don't think about it yeah you, you overthink it and you're just going to train wreck yeah and that's you know that's you always capture those those magic moments and we were really well rehearsed so that's that's it's that can be a good thing and a bad thing because i mean both records I did with the band, we did we did pre-production with Marty, and then we did pre-production with Kelly, and we we went in there, we nailed it, and 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 I think um, I think putting throwing that twist in there, like you said, it's just it's especially when we had it that well rehearsed, it it's just something that just threw it off out of the comfort zone. So, that's what you want, yeah. Yeah. Get, yeah. get pushed outside of that box. Mm -hmm. That's a huge plus. So so going forward to now i mean you probably picked up all sorts of different um obviously experience but tools or you know i call it a toolbox you, you got sure. so many things you bring with you I, I, as being a guitar player or musician or uh, a producer or whatever um i guess is there anything specific from from the wishful album that you think that you learned from that might help you as a musician or, or as a producer um just all the things i said and just you know again the being well rehearsed is a great is a great thing you know it's it's more good than not good um um some and that, bands go ahead off, not, not to cut you off Dave, but some bands do go into the studio with kind of the core song but they haven't rehearsed it 150 times 
and that's that's about that. So that, that makes that makes a huge huge impact right yeah there's something to be said for both scenarios for sure if you've got the time if you've got the you've got the budget or you have a a, a studio where the clock's not running sure why not write in the studio yeah might as well you got nothing to lose yeah oh. sure. so what what are your thoughts on uh kind of bounce around here on di digital like Kemper, Helix, all these new things that are out. Have you played with any of that stuff? Um, well, I use a lot of I use a lot of amp plugins. I have I oh. have for twenty five years, almost thirty years. Um, I, I don't exclusively exclusively do it, but um, there's there's uh, I would say that I'm probably more in the box than out of the box. Um, they're just so good, and and you know I I record most of my stuff at home. And um, and I've I've spent a lot of money on acoustical treatment, but um, you know I don't have I don't have a big a big room, so it's, there's there's certain things that um, if I purposely want a room, I'm gonna I'm gonna use a live amp. And if, if I'm recording in the studio, I'm I'm always I'm almost always through a live amp, and um, make sure we get the sound. But I always insist that we have a clean track, it's just because. And there's you know there's sense engineers and producers that 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 i work with that are that hate that and some that that's all they do and um and i and there's again they're they're, they're philosophies that are all bright they're all correct they're just different but uh to me i think both because because um like there was a session i was doing on one of my tunes and um it was a uh, it was one of those i didn't have a huge amount of studio time for that day well, I had the whole day, but but uh, I knew I wasn't coming back for a few days, and I and we were spent a lot of time on the guitar sounds, and I said, you know what, let's roll with it. We've got a raw track, and uh, um, you know, it's a little bit of a, a a push and pull in 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 the room to to make that decision. And to me, I wanted I didn't want to use the creative energy time to go down that rabbit hole. If again, if we had a month blocked, like when I've done records like like wish pool with with bands that you have that you just you're just in there but if but you're if you're doing spot sessions you got to make the most of your time so that's when that's when relying on that kind of stuff i think is convenient but again um like when when dragmatic when we recorded um we uh my marshall was uh you know died you know it didn't it was sick it didn't die but um the other <laughs> Our players were real gearheads. Um, uh, Chris Robinson had a great match list. Daniel Lewis had a Fender Boogie, and they sounded great. And I was playing a Marshall, and uh, um, I just played through the Marshall the, at that time. The um, uh, what's the Line Six version Amp Farm, and the other guitar wow. players are purists. They said, "Man, it sounds like your Marshall." I said, "Yeah, you know, it's fine." Um, and I used like Universal Audio amp plugins, um, also. Uh, um amplitude I, and uh, i use that as well that's cool good yeah uh guitar rig is another one that i i use for for recording now it's what a, comes that oh geez oh i just had it on the tip of my tongue is it waves what's that is it waves yeah i think so yeah i yeah I, i've yeah. used that that's that's a great one too it's it, it's got everything you need it's yeah you, it's it's and it's come a long way from when i was using amp farm too and there's probably some purist listening to this going ah oh, fuck that but yeah. you know i personally um my ears aren't good enough to tell a lot of difference between analog and digital situations that's just me so yeah for me it's only, only thing that the sound as long as the sounds are i'm happy but I'm so used to my ears are so I mean, you're probably the same way where your ears are so shot that I yeah. love to feel the 412 vibrate my pants or my foot or whatever yeah behind me even though if I can't hear it at least I can feel it yeah just that having it right behind me um that's the main thing so you know, some of these guys you know like uh I was with Mark Tremonti he was showing me his rig and his he had two 
four twelves that were his stage sound, so he could hear himself. But then he had IRs going directly to the house. So really? that, that was his only monitoring system, really, aside from the wedges up front. But a lot of the oh, heads were just going IR. Yeah, he always had a great sound. We we did a lot of sh a lot of shows with Creed. Yeah, he always had a killer live sound. I didn't think about that. You guys being yeah being down basically next to each other. When all, I I was uh, it was an Alter Bridge show that I got to see some of his different setups. I've done it a few times. You know, went early, went got to meet him, hang out, and do whatever, and go up to stage, see his rig, and yeah. God, some of the tones he gets just out of the simple Mesa rectifier is just like killer tones. Back. Tones that I ever use, but but for that tone, nobody does that tone better. I mean, it's 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 yeah. great. And I haven't seen Alter Bridge. I uh, we did some shows with. Is it Mayfield Four? Is that yep. yes, Miles, Miles Kennedy? Yeah, I didn't know about him. I just knew that, that God, that guy can sing. <laughs> and then yeah. I put two together when they got together later. That that was that guy. And the guy can play. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think he was doing some uh, rehearsing with the Zeppelin guys. He did. He played with them, man. Yeah. They wanted to go out and do something. He yeah. He told them no. Well, yeah. I guess you're pretty good if you're doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, sorry, Jimmy Page. I'm busy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's cool, man. Well, anything else you want to touch on? I mean, kind of touched on gear and everything else. I mean, I guess I see some practice amps in the background. What what would be your go-to kind of practice amps and stuff? I kind of use a couple different things. I got some bosses and black stars and stuff like that. I don't know if you, what you can see or can't yeah. see. I don't know. It looks like what? a black star or something. A little black star. That's that little travel amp. Um, Okay. And, and I don't know if you can see. That's one of those box. Can you see what I'm pointing at? Yep, yep. And that's one of those little box. It's like got the little nanotube in it. Um, that's that's oh. my that works, the local one that's gonna be switched to British. It's my Friedman. It's my son speed up. And, oh, can you see the freedom? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I I, I think I'm gonna get a matching 412 for that because I use this 212 swamp works, but it's just um you yeah, said so, that was a runt? I don't even own, yeah, it's a runt 50. I don't even own a 412 anymore because we, ARS, we backline all the time. So, right. um, but I really want to get a, a 412 to match the Friedman. And this one over here, the, it, does, it doesn't it does have the logo on it. Can you see it next to the tally? I see a little bit of it. That's. Not a line six. Yeah, no, it's it's a Laney. And my buddy. Oh. I. Um, Tommy that builds my guitars, I went into a shop. I said, I need a, I need the best sounding um, little quiet tube recording amp. He said, this is the ugliest amp in the store and it's the best for that situation. <laughs> that, like I've taken it to sessions um, where I know that, because um, a, a lot of times if I'm doing sessions for somebody else, chances are I'm going to be, you know, in the box, but, but I want to have amps, especially, yeah. um, if, if I need to be able to be interacting with the speaker and getting some sustain and getting that stuff, I'll take that little thing in there and, and it's just, it's just killer. Oh, that's cool. That's, that, that, that's about all the amps I have now. I, I, it don't take much, man. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, now I want to go check out the rent. Now you get, uh, get the gear bug. I'll start out buying more shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Luckily, my my wife is is uh, you know there's all the jokes like um, they've got the the good fellas when they're laughing and it, and it's got uh, uh who's the, the main character Ray Liotta and he's laughing. He says hey. and my wife says, Daddy, do you really need one more guitar? And uh, my wife's pretty cool. She's like you know. When I'm when I get in gear mode, she's she's like the opposite of, of my ex that was making me sell stuff to buy Christmas stuff, which I thank fine. you. I was totally fine with that. She's like, get it, you know, get it. Yeah. And uh all right, okay. So but that being said, um, if anything, I've 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 
pared down what I have just because I because I don't play live with my own gear as much and and but there's always something you need. There's always if I just have this one thing. It doesn't end. Yeah. So <laughs> pedals. Yeah, funny you mention that because my ex wife would bitch, piss, and moan if I bought anything. And then uh obviously ditched her, got my new wife and uh she loved my Taylor acoustic and watched me play and how passionate I was. And I said, you know, I said, do you mind? I already bought a few guitars. Mm -hmm. I already owned a handful. And I said, do you mind if I uh, buy this guitar and that guitar and possibly the third one? She said, buy whatever you want. Yeah, that's great. I said, yeah. you shouldn't have said that because now it looks yeah. like guitar center. Yeah. Here. But <laughs> <laughs> so it's her fault. Right, right. <laughs> That's a problem. That's a very good problem. Cool, man. Well, I appreciate you chatting with us and stuff. I mean, it's much fun. Yeah, I, yeah. I had a blast. I, I still couldn't find my fuzzy boots. Otherwise, I would show them off. Yeah, and you know, my spandex I think got lost in the move somewhere. Oh, Damon's gonna have to mail you his, his backups. You know, I joke about it. I somehow made it through the eighties without without buying spandex. I don't know how I did it, but uh, <laughs> like I, being at London Bridge, seeing those pictures of what? like like the band that um, uh, Cantrell, who's yeah, and and uh, the pictures that I think was it on yours or was it on Johnny's that I saw for tease. I didn't realize the Alice in Chains story. That that's a funny one. Yeah, and there was yeah. that um, who's the lead guitar player for Pearl Jam? Um, Mike McCready. There was there was an '80s uh, band shot at London Bridge that was hysterical. So it's like all all of us at our age went through that. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. I think at that point people were more wanting to hide it because because uh, '80s rock was the devil. But I think that's all that stuff has kind of fallen away. You know, it's all it's all music now. But but back then it was those were bad words. You know, hairspray. <laughs> <laughs> oh good times yeah cool man well um yeah i can't think of anything else to touch on but i think we covered a lot of ground but now i'm gonna go check out the run 20 see what yeah. that's about it's great this if i don't know if i said the 20 this is actually a 50 yeah uh uh our tech for for ars when he we do backline gigs that that we're that we're driving he'll usually backline with his gear and he's he had a run 20 which i loved it but i couldn't get the clean channel loud enough for the drums i don't even use a clean channel with ars i just roll off the volume but yeah. uh i when i heard i borrowed his runt and um and I, I needed more headroom on the clean so i got the 50 but that you know it sounds like a fender amp on the clean channel but we'll see that which fender amp would you say it is like princeton or a twin or i think it's kind of like a cross between a deluxe and a twin i mean it doesn't have the oh. have the headroom of a twin obviously because it's 50 yeah. watts and it's not as harsh it's not as spiky as a twin it's you yeah. know even super um but it's 50. yeah because the, the high end is not nearly as spiky got it that makes sense yeah i was look, looking at some of the 20 watts a lot of power, plenty of power, plenty of good yeah. tone. But I, I want to be able to have like that tender, clean tone. Yeah, I mean, if we can capture that and have the balls on the other side. Yeah, then that's dynamite in a box right there. For sure. <laughs> yeah. So cool. Well, I think uh, we cover a lot of ground, man. I, I, yeah, I, I can't think enough for taking the time to chat with me and discuss well, thank you for and fun sharing some sharing some good jokes and whatnot yeah so, i mean, see that shirt back there you probably recognize oh is that a, that's a wish pull tour shirt isn't it yeah so i picked it up off of ebay someone had it and uh, i had i had damon sign it at uh at nam oh cool and, and <clears throat> because i wanted that shirt I can never find it so i bought the gray one instead about two of them and then uh that was on ebay someone it's like brand new so i brought it to nam and damon signed it nice so that's why i put it up for you 
Yeah. <laughs> he was telling me about the squig, the squiggly logo, or squig, or whatever he called it. Yeah. The logo. Yeah. Everything had to have the squig on it, or whatever he said. <laughs> I don't have any of that stuff. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't save any of that stuff from touring. I, I should have. I didn't have the foresight. Yeah. Taking pictures too. That's another thing. You know, with we all take pictures now, but I never had a camera. I don't have a picture of Eddie and me. I, uh, our oh. guitar tech, rest in peace. He was the picture taking fiend, and it's been like a kind of a. Uh, there's there could be a podcast on the mystery of his photos because everybody wanted to find his photo because he took tons of photos on on the road. So, I think it's it's an ongoing mystery, but we'll see. <laughs> That'd be cool if you can get a pic, find a picture of you and Ed. Yeah, there's a great now. There's a picture. It's on my Facebook that my buddy Timothy, the guitar tech, that took the pictures. It's, it's, it's him, Michael Anthony, and me on stage at Soundcheck. At um, uh, well, I hope you're editing this because I because I can go on and on. Um, yeah, well. it's we're we're at uh, Fiddler's Green in in um in Colorado, and I I saw on Van Halen's uh website that have history things that had a story about the fiddler's green um it was a, a snowstorm there's a blizzard and it started during sound check and there's a picture of timothy saunders my tech and friend michael anthony me with the, with the with the seats in the background you could see the snow there was nobody there they could see all the snow starting so that's oh, one of them that, that's a show eddie was wearing a beanie and cut off gloves and everything else Yep, we had we had like those jet engine heaters. Yep. Same with Nick. And uh um and at one point the show was was it was questioned this question whether it was gonna go on and, and we were all just kinda hanging out in you know, at sound check and Eddie walked up to me and said, Can you sing those Sammy songs? I said, Hell no. And he was kidding. I thought there's no way he really would sing it, but just cutting up. It's like shit. No way. <laughs> <laughs> but he That's made another, it. Uh Steam that song yeah Did you like that, one? that song the other day because i because I, I once in a while i go go through the the all the stuff i've recorded and listen to it not often but that was a, that was a great live song that we played oh you you kicked that thing off your telly man that oof. yeah that's it that's the telly tone at work for sure and it's funny because uh um in the in the 90s the there was there was the punk influence was was inescapable in the '90s for the down all downstrokes thing, and uh, um, and when we were playing it, Damon said I was you know doing my regular up and down um, grid, you know all the all the 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 downbeats were downstrokes yeah. or upstrokes, and he said, "Can you try that all downstrokes?" And I was like, "Oh yeah, that's way better." He was play you played downstrokes on that. Yeah, it's all downstrokes. I, I play up every time. Yeah, that'd be hard to play down. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's just my muscle memory. Yeah, it's all it's all downstrokes. Oh, I'm gonna try that now. Which there was a lot of stuff that, that we, because because uh, I think when we did seeds, there was a lot of a lot of pressure in some ways we put on ourselves and and all the powers that be put on us to to sound more '90s. And I think I think it was it was a moral issue to where I think the band never really felt like they. Def definitely didn't sell out and definitely didn't lose what the band was about it was just yeah. like being it's just being influenced by what's going on around you because i mean that first record was it was so it was root southern rock it was it yeah. was guns and roses meets black crows and then all of a sudden i remember we were doing a, a rehearsal um it was it was at the the rehearsal place that was crosby stills crosby stills and nash and um, neil young and all those all those people rehearsed there and uh the the guy that ran it was was a big fan of the first record and he called us like brother jam or something like making fun of the the 90s stuff that we brought in a little bit it was yeah. like well we're all listening to it so it's not like you know it's not like we're trying to be something we're not it was just it was just 
that was all around us. There's no, it was just inescapable that it's not going to make its way in. I can't remember what song it was off the top of my head. I, it might have been Kerosene when that album hit our radio station up here. Full Shine On wasn't released to the public first, even though I love that song. Don't get me wrong. But it was like Kerosene, I think it was. Um, anyway, was that one or one other song that turned me on to the CD? And then this radio station announced you guys, you know, Brother Kane, you know, new album, Seeds, go out and get it. And I did. I went straight down to Target, went down and they had it. <laughs> and that's what turned me on. It was a totally different song. And then I heard Full Shine On. And I was like, I think I've heard this somewhere. I recognized it. Yeah. But the, the, uh, yeah, it's funny because the whole, a lot of people are familiar with it, you know, right. One of the biggest hits. But yeah. For me, it, it it was complete opposite, which which I like. I like Blackstone Cherry out of Kentucky. Um, I love those guys and yeah. so heavy rock. A lot a lot of stuff they put out. I'll, I'll listen to stuff that's not really typical. Yeah, that's just the way I've always been wired. It's um, if you can find something a little different that can help influence you to be a better musician or guitar player think outside the box that's what i'm always looking for it just yeah, well, work. But that was our police song we called it i think we called it synchronicity three or we it was some kind of name working title that was okay. and um because like scott's drumming it's it's you know it's a total nod to stuart copeland on that song and that was that was speaking of writing in the studio those two songs, uh, Voice of Eugenia and Kerosene, the um, they needed the label said we need more songs. They, I think they they knew they had the single, but they but they wanted some more songs. So we did. Uh, technically, Marty and Damon wrote it, but we all arranged it together. Kerosene and uh, the working title was either Police or Synchronicity. And the funny thing is, we were doing a um, a broadcast album network. I think we were at Electric Lady studios um mm. doing a broadcast and um it was right before we went on and, and um we were saying how do we think how do we work the police into this and i thought about it and i said okay when we um when we go uh into the guitar solo it's f sharp minor in kerosene and that's what the riff is the beginning riff for synchronicity too <laughs> and No, it's the bridge starts in that part, F sharp minor. Um, and then it goes into E minor guitar solo. I thought, well, we could start when it goes to F minor. Instead, we go to the intro to synchronicity, do a verse. And then when it goes, uh, oh, suppose that he gets it done, da -na 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 which is back in E minor. So we oh, went yeah. into our solo there. So it fit perfectly. And it was like, it's almost like we were showing our hand that 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 was our influence on the song, but, but it worked great live. And we did yeah. it on, did it on that broadcast like 20 minutes later it, it worked out great <laughs> holy crap that's funny horses and needles was another one too i mean that whole album honestly yeah. it i like i mean i hate saying no, all killer no filler but it was that every song was different from one another but yeah it, it was just it was, it was killer. Just, because i you know um sometimes i record something and I, I listen to it a thousand times because i'm so happy about it but in the hectic nature of what we were doing um re pretty recently um i listened to seeds on the headphones and i can honestly say i don't remember ever doing that i mean because i heard it all the time um i was like it was like being able to listen to it for the first time and i could i could totally hear because if if i'm hearing it in the car on the radio or, or you know in a room or whatever and when we were playing it it's different but i didn't realize that i could tell damon's playing and my playing a part so much until i put it on the headphones yeah it's like it was like it was cool, kind of cool to go back and listen to like listening for the first time yeah you, you can definitely hear the difference but you complement each other so well you know when you listen to it in your car or on the radio 
you know, it's, it's, it sounds good, but we listen on headphones, you can definitely yeah. hear that separation. And we were going going for playing the same parts. Is one of those we're doubling the two parts left and right, but inevitably we're going to phrase it differently, and that just kind of gives gives it that. Yeah. There you go. Playing a Les Paul, and you're playing a Strat or a Telly. Yeah, yeah, and that's another thing. He was he was usually on the Les Paul, and I was usually on the Telly, so that added to that kind of layer thing too. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Well, shit. Oh, yeah. I sent you a text on that that black pick, and then I got more of these guys here. Oh yeah, I, mean, I, I, I just have of, left. I, I remember, you know, that's always been my thing. Is always that's like, hey, can I get a guitar pick? <laughs> my memento from the concert or whatever. Uh, I'm pretty sure that one's Damon's. The oh yeah, the yellow ones yeah. were Damon. But uh, yeah, I just found that black one. It was very. I got a, a box full of guitar picks and just found it in there. But, uh, yeah, we had we had a, a, a the first run were black ones, and then we we got red ones. I think it was so I could see them, if memory serves, so, so I could see them. If, <laughs> um, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not I sure. Use, I use seemed, the same ones that Damien uses, or you know these the Tortex. Yeah, orange ones, which you can see, obviously. But yeah, mine were the mine were the different. They, they were the the hot pink ones, the hot pink uh, shiny. Dunlop ones that they just we put them in different colors because they were Dunlop picks. They just Dunlop made them for us. So, gotcha, gotcha. That's cool. Right on, man. Well, I'm gonna let you go. Um, I can't think of anything else to cover, but it's been great talking with you. I really you too. Appreciate I appreciate it. Yeah, you definitely have to stay in touch, and I'm sure there's more. We have more, more stuff we have in common. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, all right. Well. Have yourself a great evening, and uh, I'll keep you posted when this uh, gets uh, goes live or whatever you want to call it. So sounds good. Thanks. I got to do. <laughs> I'll talk to you soon. All right, Dave. Have All a right. good one. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye.